Hello, I'm Kim Freeman and welcome to St. David's Bible Studies. Greetings to the Roomies and the Zoomies and the YouTubies. And if you're watching online for the first time, we'd love to send you the free class materials. So email the church at parishadmin at stdavidchurch.org and you can journey with us. Let's open with prayer. Lord, I just pray that the Holy Spirit will illumine our minds to understand this beautiful book in Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you flip to the back of your Bible, you'll see that the very last book is Revelation. Now, many people think of Revelation as utterly intimidating, scary, or just plain confusing. But there's no need to be frightened and every reason to be excited and full of hope because God has an amazing plan for the future. And Revelation is a fitting conclusion to the Bible. No book of the Bible has stirred greater fascination and curiosity or has stirred more controversy than Revelation. It has led some fanatics to set dates for the return of Jesus, even though Jesus himself said, no man will know that day or hour, not the angels, nor the son, but only the father. And it has frightened off some Christians who find themselves reeling because of its judgment and wrath, while overlooking all the incredible grace and mercy and patience that God shows as well in this book. Others want to shrug their shoulders and ignore it as indecipherable nonsense. But how sad, because God promises great blessings to each one who studies the book of Revelation and heeds its message. That's the promise found in the first chapter, verse 3. Let me read it to you. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written, because the time is near. Well, Revelation's divine mysteries, its sometimes elusive symbols, its predictions, and its use of vivid imagery are unparalleled in the rest of Scripture. As we dive into the chapters, we'll find ourselves immersed in a fantastic display of sights and sounds and colors, vision after vision unfolds. Trumpets blare, lightning flashes, thunder rumbles, lampstands glow, bizarre creatures move around, millions of glorious angels show up, joyful choirs sing out, fiery horses gallop into the scene, horrible plagues are unleashed, bowls of judgment pour out God's wrath, thrones appear, one scene follows another, moving steadily toward the ultimate finale of good versus evil. This is a story of faithful believers and rebellious people, but above all, it's about Jesus. So what should you do as you read Revelation and perhaps feel a bit overwhelmed by such an assault on your senses? Here is a helpful hint. <clears throat> Pretend you are in an art museum and imagine that you are standing in front of a great, famous, impressionist painting, but pretend you are standing very close, like near inches away from the canvas. All you can observe this up close are just random strokes of paint and blotchy dabs of color, and it's hard to make sense of it all. You can't quite see an outline or a pattern emerge. But now pretend that you back up far away from the painting. Ah, now your eye can perceive the picture. And at last, Monet's water lilies look like water lilies. <laughs> That's how we should handle the book of Revelation. When we lean in too close and look at the detail of just one word or one symbol, it can be a bit perplexing. But step back and take in the big picture of the chapter. And Revelation not only becomes understandable, but it absolutely captures our imaginations and it can even take our breath away because God is at work in the world in mighty ways. Here is the surprise that will come as you study Revelation. Even if there are moments that you'll feel confused and you will because I did, but read on. The surprise is that you will find yourself engaged as a participant in worship, just like the angels and the martyrs and the 24 elders and the four living creatures and the tribulation saints, all who show up in the story, they are worshiping. So Revelation is not all about gloom and doom. There are three interludes that suddenly interrupt the story and they pause the action just so they can feature something unexpected. And guess what it is? 
song, and worship. These interludes bring us into the presence of Jesus, believing and adoring as well. Your study of Revelation will be well rewarded because your worship of God will most certainly deepen in urgency and joy. So what is this book about? Revelation is about the events that lead up to the end of history, and it's about the second coming of Jesus and his establishment of his kingdom on earth. The book will close with mankind back in paradise from which he was banished in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. At the end of Revelation, mankind will once again have access to the tree of life and even the river of life. At last, all evil is gone and people will worship God and our faith will become sight. The biblical story thus completes a full circle back to loving fellowship between the creator and those he created in his image. The end of Revelation gives us an amazing glimpse of eternal life for those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But, as Revelation will also reveal, fallen humanity and even creation itself must go through a formidable ordeal to get there. So think of the two bookends of the Bible. Genesis is the book of beginnings and Revelation is a book of completion. All things are made new as believers are given a new name, a new song, a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, and a new earth. The Bible ends with the passing away of all that is old and the establishment of all that is new. Revelation was written for every church, every lover of God, in every generation. And it is for you and me to understand and embrace just as much as it was for the early churches who received John's letter. And by the way, this is the book of Revelation singular, not the book of Revelations plural. And that's important to know because this book emphasizes one revelation alone. And the opening verse shouts the good news in just five words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. We are going to discover the full identity of Jesus. So how do you think this we're going to accomplish this unveiling of our Savior? God sends visions mediated through his holy angels to the apostle John, who is under a prophetic spirit. And John is told to write down and record the visions of the final days of salvation history. And then his letter will immediately transmit these revelations to the community of faithful believers. This book will give warning and hope to all believers. So how exactly is Jesus Christ unveiled in this book? I mean, we already have the four Gospels, so we know the story of Jesus beginning with his birth in a humble stable, a brief glimpse of his childhood, and then the record of his three-year ministry on earth. So in those Gospels, we observe Jesus teaching and healing and delivering and loving all. He's the Messiah, deity veiled in human flesh, worshipped by some, rejected by many, crucified on a cross. The Gospels speak of Easter morning and of his resurrection, but the last view we have of him is Jesus returning to his Father, ascending to the heavens surrounded with clouds. But what happened after that? What is Jesus like right now? What is the rest of the story? We need our eyes unveiled to see him as he is now. And what you read in this book will present him in his present glory. Revelation uses a style of literature called apocalyptic. Now in Greek, the word apocalypse means revelation, unveiling, disclosing, uncovering, a bringing to light of what was formerly hidden or kept secret. And so it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It involves the unveiling of future events and we get a divine perspective on history. Apocalyptic literature attempts to describe supernatural events in ordinary terms, but when those spectacular images go beyond what is known and when vocabulary fails, symbolism is used. It reminds me of how a pioneer in the 1800s would really struggle to find the vocabulary to describe to us how a modern car works or how a computer works. You see, John sees such amazing sights that sometimes only symbols will work. Well, despite the strange images and the mysterious symbols, the message of Revelation is clear. God controls all of history, 
Christ will return to earth, good will triumph over evil, the wicked will be judged, and the faithful will be rewarded. So let's talk about John, the apostle who was given the great honor of receiving these visions. He was one of Jesus's original band of 12 disciples. However, by now decades have passed since that day long ago when a young fisherman named John, along with his brother James, literally dropped his nets to follow Jesus. During Jesus' three-year ministry, John was privileged to witness things that most of the other disciples did not see. John was one of the three disciples who were like an inner circle with Jesus. For example, Jesus singled out John, Peter, and James to accompany him to Jairus' home to witness the resurrection of Jairus' daughter. The same select three men were the only eyewitnesses to the dazzling transfiguration of Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus just called on John, Peter, and James to keep watch and pray with him that night. So John's deep loyalty to Jesus should be admired. His love for his Lord motivated him to stay close in the darkest hour. On the day of Jesus' crucifixion, John stood at the foot of the cross. The other disciples had fled. And John was given the unique responsibility to care for Jesus' mother, Mary. <clears throat> Excuse me. On Easter morning, John and Peter were the first of the, the men disciples to run to the tomb. And although Peter entered the tomb before him, it was John who was the first one to comprehend what the empty tomb meant and to believe that Jesus had risen as he said he would. Much later, in his old age, after years and years of preaching and teaching in Asia Minor, John wrote his gospel. It was the last one written, and he recorded his own memories of Jesus's earthly ministry. And then he went on to write three epistles or letters known as 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So it is certainly understandable that Jesus would appear to this beloved disciple at yet a later date and entrust him with a very special message for the church. Near the end of his life, John received an extraordinary vision from Christ. And at this point, he is about 100 years old. John is the last surviving disciple. The early apostles had all been killed for their faith in Jesus. John had been sent to Patmos, a barren, rocky island, because he bravely proclaimed the gospel. He had been banished to this Roman penal colony as the Roman authorities began to cruelly persecute the church. You know, by this time, Caesar worship had become mandatory in the Roman Empire, and Christians were pressured by the government with threats of violent persecution to renounce their faith in Jesus and worship the emperor as divine. But refusing to change their conviction that Jesus is Lord and not Caesar, many Christians were martyred, and John was a victim of this oppression, which is why he's been shipped off to Patmos. Well, besides enduring intimidation and persecution from the outside, these early churches were also struggling on the inside. Many churches had become infected with false teaching, immorality, spiritual complacency, and compromise. Even some of the faithful ones had began to flounder in disappointment and despair, wondering why hadn't Jesus returned yet, for he had told them he was coming soon. So Revelation is Jesus's message to his suffering and bewildered church. It's addressed to seven churches in Asia Minor, but it's meant for Christians everywhere, all throughout history. Jesus evaluates each church's spiritual health. And just like a modern congregation, these churches included the mixture of mature and immature believers. Many held to the Christian teachings, but there were others that were drifting into error and heresy. Things were not as they should have been in some of the churches. There was noticeable spiritual decline. And so Christ issued, I guess you could say, as a wake-up call, challenging the members to walk in righteousness. And I think these early Christians must have struggled with remaining hopeful during those days of persecution. I bet to them it seemed that evil was triumphant, triumphing, but Revelation is going to teach the opposite. Eventually, all evildoers will be punished because God is all-powerful. He will bring his children safely into eternal life. So Revelation rings with hope. What God has promised will come true. 
And we're learning that there are invisible supernatural battles occurring behind the events of history. Revelation demonstrates that no matter how bad things appear to be, ultimately God will win. Do you know, besides the second coming of Christ, Revelation teaches some other things. The wrath of God against evil, the holiness and justice of God, the future rise of evil culminating in someone called the Antichrist, the revealing of Jesus as conquering king and judge, the ultimate defeat of Satan and the part I love best, the wedding supper of the Lamb, the final judgment and the coming of the new Jerusalem. And we're going to learn that these things called seals and trumpets and bowls teach us that God has carefully measured out his wrath against evil. Revelation concludes with the promise of Christ's soon return. And in the closing verses, John breathes a prayer that has been echoed by Christians through the centuries. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So, Sandra, if we could look at those two charts in the folders, now pull up the one that says the four views of the end times and look at the one that says historic premillennialism. It's got a number 110 at the top. Okay, hold on. Now, I, the first thing I want to do is reassure you, we are not here to get lost in seminary terms, in long, strange-sounding things, words, and confusing definitions, because um, I already know that for some of you, just looking at this chart begins to cause anxiety, and it can look a little intimidating, but I don't want you to feel that way. I just want to make a simple point, and this is it. These charts describe the four different ways that people understand the book of Revelation. If you scoot down the bottom of that page to that title, Dispensational Premillennialism, by the way, I counted that as 12 syllables long. I will not be saying that. I'm just going to say the words some people think, okay? <laughs> Uh, that is going to be the perspective from which I teach. And if you were ever a fan of the Left Behind books that were years ago, that was the viewpoint those authors adopted. But it is also the viewpoint of the majority of the commentaries that I've been studying all summer long. And yet, as I will say every week, I eagerly welcome your opinions and your insights if you embrace one of the other uh, three views. Yes? Oh, <laughs> It's okay. I just want, sorry, you can just read them later with a cup of coffee. I know that they are rather daunting, but um, anyway, the point is we are going to have help to get through the book of Revelation and for the YouTube audience, you can print everything at home so you don't miss out with us. Okay, so put the charts away. I've already stressed my audience. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so the main point is simply this. You could take them down. Um, I want you to know that dedicated, faithful, loving people, can, oh, I've lost my script, hold this a minute, can all look at the very same scripture and interpret Revelation differently. So you might wonder, why is that? Well, for centuries, people have debated various aspects, such as the timing of the rapture of the church. And by the way, we'll define all these terms. Don't worry. The timing of Jesus's return, the nature of the millennial reign of Christ. And that big word, millennial, just means thousand year reign. Debates have raged over the identity of the beast the number 666, and the identity of the 144,000 who are sealed. You see, some Bible scholars interpret the details literally. Other Bible scholars regard them symbolically. But the most important issue is whether a person believes that Jesus will one day return for his people and whether one has trusted him as personal savior. All the rest are just merely issues for discussion, not fundamental issues that affect a person's salvation. Because every one of these four viewpoints has weak points and strong points. Not one of them has all the right answers and not one of them has all the wrong answers. So we're each responsible for studying God's word, praying for the Holy Spirit's wisdom, and adopting the view that we believe is best supported by scripture. And then for those times when scripture is not clear, and oh, there will be those times, we can lovingly agree to disagree and just show graciousness and respect to those who look at a different position. Okay, so one last thing. Revelation is famous for its symbolism. For example, Jesus is portrayed as a lamb and a lion. 
Churches are portrayed as lampstands. Satan is pictured as a dragon with seven heads and ten horns. You see, symbols convey information, but they also arouse our emotions and our imaginations. Here's an example. John could have written an ordinary sentence that would go like this. An evil dictator will one day rule the world. But instead, he described a great beast who was given power to make war against the saints. That stirs up so much more, that more than just the word dictator. So symbols and parables and pictures are the language of scripture, and they point us to a greater reality. So Sandra, if you'll put up the handout then that says the triumph of the lamb. Uh, let's see, I'll show you which whoever that is. That is our summary for this introduction. Yeah, looks like this. Okay. And just follow along with me. Welcome to the start of an amazing journey through the last book of the Bible, Revelation. What is this incredible book all about? The resurrected, glorified Jesus Christ revealed himself to his apostle John, who was imprisoned on the island of Patmos because of his faith. Jesus had a twofold purpose in this encounter with his beloved disciple. First, Jesus issued a spiritual diagnosis of seven churches in Asia Minor. And second, he revealed events related to the end times by giving John a series of visions. How could we summarize these mysterious visions? Simply put, God has a plan and a future for the world. God will be victorious over evil. There will be a final accounting for our faith in our lives. And there is a better world in store. Oh, yes. Revelation is a book about the future and the present. It offers future hope to all believers, especially those who have suffered by, for their faith by proclaiming Christ's triumph over evil and the reality of eternal life with him. It also gives present guidance as it teaches us how we should live for Christ Jesus now. Here's a very simple outline of the whole book. The first three chapters are the message or letters to the churches. John reported Jesus's message to seven congregations that were active at that time, and yet his words still apply to Christians today. Jesus both commended the churches for their strengths and warned them about their flaws. Some of the congregations had become loveless, immoral, lenient, compromised, lifeless, or apathetic about their faith. Others were faithfully loving others, enduring persecution, and proclaiming the gospel amid great hardship. Jesus revealed how he felt about these qualities through encouragement and rebuke. And then all the rest of the book is just a message for the church. These chapters, much like an epic drama, are filled with scenes that portray what will happen before Jesus' second coming. There are cosmic events, strange creatures, important things that happen after seals are broken, trumpets are blown, and bowls are poured out. The scenes build in intensity as the plot heads toward a dramatic conclusion. And the final chapters are a beautiful message from the bridegroom Christ to his bride, the church. More than anything else, Revelation is all about Jesus. We will encounter many names for him as we behold him carrying out his father's blueprint for the end of history and the beginning of eternity. We glimpse Jesus' great power and glory in various roles, such as, in the first three chapters, he is the exalted head of the church. Jesus as Savior is responsible for the church's present discipline and future reward. And then we see Jesus as the worthy Lamb of God. John is given a vision where he beholds the throne room of heaven. There he witnesses the worship of God the Father and Jesus the Son, the Lamb of God who is worthy to reveal future events through the breaking of a seven-sealed scroll. The scroll judgments disclose the first stages of divine wrath upon the earth. And yet even in the midst of judgment, God's grace and mercy prevail. And then we see Jesus as the righteous redeemer who judges. The second wave of seven judgments begins, and they're called the seven trumpets. They introduce the next stage in divine wrath, a more intense display of God's righteous judgments against stubborn, unrepentant sinners. And just as the trumpet blasts approach a deafening crescendo, there is a pause in the action, and John is recommissioned to prophesy concerning these events. 
Then we behold Jesus as the sovereign Lord. After the seventh trumpet is blown in heaven to announce the arrival of Jesus' kingdom, John receives visions that portray the earthly and spiritual kingdom set up in opposition to Christ. John sees the rise of two future tyrants, one political and one religious, energized by Satan, who are allowed to rule the world virtually unchecked for three and a half years. Then we see Jesus' vengeance as the glorious deliverer. In this section, the blasphemous exploits of Earth's wicked rulers lead to visions that culminate in the final gathering of the people on Earth. At this point, the faithful people of God are delivered, while the rebellious, unrepentant people are harvested in judgment. That will be a hard chapter to read. John receives another vision that describes the most severe plagues of the end times, and they're called the seven bowls of wrath. An angel explains to John that this is a detailed description of the wicked empire's judgments and the victory of God's people. And my favorite part is the reign of the coming king. John witnesses a brilliant scene of the second coming of Jesus with his armies, after which Christ and his resurrected saints begin their thousand-year reign of peace. This culminates in the final destruction not only of Satan, but of evil, pain, and death itself. John witnesses an incredible depiction of the eternal state of peace and perfection in the new heaven and new earth. And the wonderful concluding words of Revelation remind us that Jesus is coming again soon. So here is a simple preview of the 22 chapters in Revelation. Jesus and his church begins with a blessing and an introduction. Then we see Jesus walking among his churches. And then we read the love letters to the bride a journey to heaven, a view of the future universal church through heaven's open door. And then we will meet the lion, the lamb, and the scroll. Then begin the judgments of the lamb. So the lamb opens the seven seals, at which time the first interlude happens, and we see 144,000 people sealed. Then angels sound the seven trumpets, and there's a second interlude. John eats the scroll and prophesies, and we meet two interesting people, the two witnesses. Then there's a third interlude, the woman and the dragon, and the dragon is Satan, two beasts, the antichrist and the false prophet, then the harvest of the earth. Then there's a song for the end, angels pour out the seven bowls, the fall of Babylon, and then are the great chapters that start with the reign of the king, we read of the return of Jesus the King, 1,000 years in the great white throne judgment, and eternity begins by making all things new. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So <laughs> let me just finish with some encouragement. <laughs> I've left you all breathless. Hold on. I just want you to know this 66 book of the Bible not only furnishes all that God wants us to know about his plans for the end times, but it tells us, you see, the rest of the story about our Messiah. We know Jesus already as our suffering Savior on a cross, and we know him as the risen Christ who's gone to prepare a place for us in heaven. But what is Jesus doing right now? And what about the church, the bride of Christ? All these issues are covered in Revelation. In fact, did you know that Revelation talks more about eternal life than any other book in the whole Bible? God does not want you to be ignorant of his plans or be worried about evil or worried about the end times. Because despite its daunting reputation, this letter is a message of hope and promise. By the end of our study, you're going to know these things for certain. Jesus will return home, to will return to take us home. He'll triumph over every evil power. He'll return to a new Jerusalem, bringing us with him. He's going to reign over the world as king, and he will judge unbelievers just as he promised. So if you were to just pick a random group of Christians and ask them what the theme of Revelation is, you would hear some pretty interesting responses, maybe like, well, it's all about those end times, or it's all about the awful stuff that happens in the tribulation, and I think it's got something to do with the number 666. <laughs> well, all of them would be correct, but there is an important theme that weaves through this letter of pain and hope and wrath and love and judgment and grace, and it's not a what, but a who. 
The book of Revelation is all about Jesus Christ from start to finish. He carries out the will of the Father, and his is the name above all names. So we'll discover that the ultimate focus of this letter, it's not the rapture, it's not the tribulation, it's not Israel, it's not the church, it's not the new heaven or new earth, but it is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the powerful Lion of Judah and the Lamb who was slain. In Revelation, we're privileged to catch some glimpses of what goes on in heaven when the Lamb is worshipped. And someday, we too are going to join those great multitudes who shout, Hallelujah, for the Lord God Almighty reigns. It's their song. So you might think, what are the practical aspects of studying this book? I mean, shouting Hallelujah is fine for heaven, but what about the difficulties I'm walking through right now? Well, shouting hallelujah is the practical point for today. If you have God's eternal perspective on what is happening, you make right choices today and you can walk through those trials and sorrow. Since no one knows when Jesus will appear, we are told to be ready. And it means to keep our faith strong and live as God wants us to live because there is glory up ahead we are not eternally bound to failing bodies in a decadent culture or pain or sorrow. If we will just open our spiritual eyes and make it our goal to know Jesus, he will surely bless our study with a profound revealing of himself. And if you read Revelation all the way to the end, I guarantee you're going to finish with a smile on your face. So let's dive bravely into this final book of the Bible. We'll approach it as wanderers and worshipers. Revelation was meant to be read, not skipped, not avoided. And my hope is that everyone who gets to the last verse will finally exclaim, I get it. God has an amazing plan. <laughs> Come Lord Jesus. So thank you for joining us. God bless you and see you next week.